chapter of Acts is where we'll be. Good morning. Good morning out there in interwebs. So we are in the 15th chapter of Acts, the Council at Jerusalem. And I want to start with verse 16. We're going to basically be going to the judgment, but I want to go back to that quote uh, from Amos 9. If some of you want to turn to Amos 9, verses 11 and 12, it's in the Old Testament. Amos, Obadiah, yeah, all right, so if you want to turn to Amos 9, verses 11 and 12, we're going we're gonna to look at a difference that's there. I love when technology works. Here we go. Okay. And it's right after Joel, Amos 9. So this is about uh, a section about Israel destroyed and Israel restored. Uh, God's talking to his people and, and telling them what's coming. And uh, so if you're looking at Amos 9, 11, and 12, I'm going to read the quote from the New Testament and see if there's a difference, okay? After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does these things. Anybody notice a difference? It's close, but it's, it's just off a little bit. So what the explanation for that is, when you're reading Amos, you're reading the translation out of the Masoretic text, out of the Hebrew or Aramaic. When you're reading it in the New Testament, more often they're quoting the Septuagint version of the Masoretic text. The Septuagint, uh, 600 B.C., so it's a very old copy. Um, and what happened was, as the Jews went to other areas, people wanted to, they couldn't read the Hebrew, but they wanted to be able to read. Greek was the language, so they had scholars get together theologians get together, and they translate it. Supposedly, it's called the 70, the Septuagint. Septuaginta is 70 in Greek. And supposedly, they had 70 scholars get together. They translated from the Hebrew to the Greek, and all of the, all of the translations agreed completely. If, if I gave you something to translate, and you all understood the languages very well, and we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, sixteen. There's sixteen of us in this room. We'd have thirty-two translations because some of us couldn't make up our mind, you know. But, but anyway, the the whole point was whatever the the text they were working with, they translated it and they came out with this. What becomes a picture of what the Masoretic text or what the Hebrew text was at that time. Remember, at that point in time, it's not all joined together in one book until the Septuagint. It's all separate scrolls. Septuagint becomes the first time that they're all brought together in one, one place. And so the Septuagint becomes a reference for the nations as to what the Hebrew text says. Now, this is, this is a quote from the Septuagint, and if you go into Septuagint, you'll understand why it is what it is. So... Yes. 
I believe, 600 B.C., 600 years before Jesus came. Uh, so it was after the Assyrian captivity, the Babylonian captivity. No, the Babylonian captivity, not Syrian. Um, so it was after the Persian Empire and the Greeks come in. And so they want a translation of what this text is. And so the scholars uh, do the translation. And I believe the date is right around, right around 600, 716, earlier than I thought. Uh, Uh, the Assyrians, uh, 750, or 728, the Israelites return. So about 15 years after that. Um, but, all right, so after this, I will return. Now, in, I, I, why, did I, why did I turn away from that? Because I'm not thinking straight. Amos, Obadiah. No, I don't want Amos and Obadiah. Amos 9. All right. Um, so in verse 11, in that day is the Hebrew version. In the, the Greek, it's after this. Amos is given a prophecy to, to talk about what the Lord says was going to happen. Um, there's been a discussion on online uh, in one of the groups I'm in, are people prophets today? And my answer is yes. And But a lot of the people in foreign countries will say, no, prophecy ended when Jesus came. And it's all in how you define prophet. For them, prophet is telling the future. But prophet truly in the Old Testament is, they'll always say, thus says the Lord. That's, that's the mark of the prophet, thus says the Lord. When we preach, when we teach, we're, it's not me, it's the Lord. We're talking about what the Lord says. And so to me, there is that prophecy aspect of the pastoral ministry and teaching ministry. Um, but the prophet always points to, points to what the Lord is talking about. Now, many times the Lord is talking about what's coming in the future, you know, even in Jonah, 40 days and then it will be restored. It starts right now. Starts right now, but it's, it's talking about what's going to happen 40 days from now. So there is that futuristic aspect, but it's not the futuristic aspect. It's that this is what the Lord of hosts says. Okay? So in Amos, he's talking about a period of time that's coming in, in the Septuagint version, it went to after this. So it's after the destruction. If you go back and you read the first 10 verses of Amos, it's all about how Israel is going to be torn down. You know, though they hide themselves on the town, mount, top of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide it from me at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent to bite them. Though they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will fix my eyes upon them for evil and not for good. You know, I mean, this is, this is God's wrath, God's judgment being poured out upon Israel. Now, Amos says in that day, but the Septuagint picked it up after these things. Okay? Or after this. So it's, it's, all right, so at the, the assurances after the destruction of Israel, God's going to restore. And here's how he's going to do it. I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, or I will re rebuild David's fallen tent in Hebrew. Now, The Hebrew word, or the Greek word, I'll cut it out. I don't like that Ada. Gene, 
is what the Greeks used to translate the Old Testament word for tent. David's fallen tent. Skene, or skena toss, is the word that's used throughout the Old Testament in the Septuagint for the tabernacle. It doesn't refer to the king. It refers to God being with the people. So it's a tabernacle. I will restore the tabernacle of David, uh, that presence that God had with the people during the time of David, more than that kingship. You can go with the kingship from Amos, but Jesus doesn't come to set up a kingdom. He does, but he doesn't. You know, Pilate thinks he's, he's setting up a kingdom here. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my subjects would have fought that I not be taken. Jesus is clearly not setting up that, but he is setting up the new tabernacle. And that's what John picks up in the first chapter. The word dwelt among us. That, by the way, dwelt among us is that skenatos. So John, in describing what Jesus is doing when he comes, is talking about Amos 9, verse 11. David's tabernacle is being restored because it's a twofold. It is that Davidic line and that commitment to God, David leading God's people, uh, but it's also that God, that recognition that God is among his people. So it's more than just, hey, Israel, we're going to have a king to sit on the throne. It's, hey, Israel, we're going to have a, 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 God, a, a king who will lead us as, as God's people. And even, you know, Samuel says that. Nathan says that about David, that, they, that David will be that shepherd for God's people to lead them in the, in the ways of the Lord. And so when we look at what David's all about, it's all about that tabernacling or that indwelling of God among God's people. So really the, the Septuagint clarifies it. And, and by the way, the word in the Hebrew can be tent or the tabernacle was called the tent of meeting. So it, it, it is an ambiguity that the translators from the Hebrew pick up the word the fallen tent, they, they, that, that household of David. And I think it is that, that desire for that, ki that kingdom again, that earthly kingdom, that I can touch it, I can feel it. You know, I can't touch the tabernacle, I can't feel the tabernacle, I can't feel God dwelling in me. Well, we can, but not in that way. And so it, it was more of that physical relationship because Messiah hadn't come. So it, it's okay, so what we're looking for is we're looking for a king to return to us. And so it's the fallen tent. They would interpret that as they, somebody's going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. So he's going to kick the Muslims out. He's going to destroy that dome of the rock and, and build the, the final temple and, and the, the palace is going to be there, and he is going to re rule supreme, and it will be over all people. That's, that's their goal. And that's, by the way, that's why they don't accept Jesus as Messiah. It's because the kingdom isn't restored. When Messiah comes, kingdom will re be restored. Okay? And so there is that that throws people off, you know, that it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, how, what, what's the difference here between tabernacle and tent? Uh, well, the, the tabernacle was a specific tent. And so when the camp would be set up, it would be the tent of meeting or tabernacle would be set up in the center of the camp and three tribes would be on the south, three tribes on the north, three tribes on the east, three, three tribes on the west. Wherever they set up, whenever they set up that tabernacle, they set the tabernacle up first, and then the, the tribes were scattered out from that. And, and understand, that may have been 100,000 or more people in each of those tribes. Think about the size of that camp. By the way, we like to think they set up, and then the next morning they moved on. 
Most likely not. Most likely they'd set up and they'd stay a, a little bit of time uh, because it just the work of setting up the camp and tearing down the camp would be so uh, such a uh, chore. You'd, you know, you'd set up the camp, you'd go to sleep, and you'd start tearing the camp down and move five miles, and you'd have to start setting up the camp again to get it done by dark. And so they would they would do that. Most likely they would stay uh, a nut you know, a time, but they would set it up. And so the, the tribes would be, so God would always be in the center of the camp. A everyone had equal access. All right. Any questions on that part? I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. All right, here's the next difference. In Amos, we have, uh, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do all, all these things. So you get Edom. I'm going to erase that. And now you get your Hebrew, Hebrew lesson. We're going to start off with three Hebrew letters. Everybody's going, okay. You, you know, when I pick up my Hebrew Bible, and I, or when I was learning my Hebrew Bible, I, every time I looked at it, it looked like somebody had just shaken bugs out. Going. So that those three letters become two different words. And it's all in the vowel pointing. Yeah, you caught that. So, 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 Professor, what what's it supposed to be? Favorite story of mine. I don't. I, I'm going to tell a story. So this this brilliant physicist was journeying around the country, and was giving these lectures, and uh, his driver would always sit in the back of the room and. The professor was getting kind of full of himself, and the driver finally said to him, you know what, I've heard that lecture so many times I could give it myself. And the professor said, no, you couldn't. The driver said, yes, I could. So they th the driver said, uh, the professor said, okay, pull over. We'll change outfits. I'll drive into the next place. You give the lecture. And so the guy did. He got up, and he gave the lecture. He had, he had it all memorized by heart. And then the presenter said, now, does anybody have any questions? And the first guy raises his hand and he says he sa gives a question, and the guy at the podium says, "You know what? That's such a stupid question. My chauffeur could answer that <laughs> one." Anyway, so chauffeur, what's the answer? So it's an O. So this one becomes the word Edom. So it, it's Alpha, uh, Aleph, Dala. And mem, uh, but the, the the root letters are the same. Now understand in in the original Old Testament text, much of it didn't have vowel pointing, so you would be working without that. And so when you when you start interpreting it, so what's the difference? Okay, Adam. By the way, you you know Adam as a person, but Adam, Adama, is mankind. Edom
I'm going to just take it to its logical conclusion. Edom refers to Esau. It's the second name for Esau. Uh, and Edumia becomes Palestine. Uh, Esau and Ishmael become uh, relatives when Esau marries into Ishmael's family. And, of course, Ishmael becomes the father of Islam uh, many years later. What, uh, 600 or 980? 900, I think. Eight, 600? No. Yeah, 600. I think it's 600 AD. Um, and, uh, and, by the way, the, the Masoretic text we use today is not finalized until 900 AD. All right, so, but so Edom and Adam, it, it, it could go either way when you look at the Hebrew in the old Hebrew. In the new Hebrew, they've got it clearly pointed so that when our translators look at it, they say uh, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. But in the Septuagint, they picked up that the rest of mankind, so it's, it's not a possessing, but it's rather a seeking, zeteo, uh, that Adam, that mankind can seek or be sought by the Lord. So again, when they when they're translating the Septuagint, they have much of a much more of a worldview than a nation view. And of course, even in the Old Testament times, who is the enemy of the Jews? What? No. What? The Philistines. Philistines are descendants of Edom and Ishmael. And that's why Herod the Edomian is actually an Edomite, is actually more Muslim than Jew, although the Muslims didn't exist at the time of Herod. I don't care if my iCloud is out of date. Windows is such a wonderful thing. But without Windows, I don't have a touch screen. Um, and so when we look at Edom is the enemy already then. The, most of the time when they're fighting, they're fighting the the, Palestine, uh, the Philistines. Uh, hold on a second. Let me pull that map up. Uh, I think that one. I know, you don't like the way I hit you. Uh, that's not doing it. This is a map from the time of David. Um, the Philistines are down in what region? Gaza. By the way, traditionally the land of the Philistines, the descendants of Edom and Esau and Ishmael. So not just now are the Palestinians there, but that's traditionally been their homeland. From the get-go, um, there, there never was a time in history that from the river to the sea, Palestine was free. Never was a time. So they can claim that that was their kingdom. The only way you can get to that claim is through Herod, who Rome puts in just to tick off the Jews, because the Jews want one of their kings to be king, Herod's not truly a king of the Jews. He, he's Rome's king. And Edom is down here. Actually, Edom kind of stretches across the bottom of the Dead Sea over towards the Philistines. So at one point, the Philistine land may come all along this bottom green line, but it never does stretch up until... The Romans take over uh, what will be called by them Palestine, a, a kind of a butchering of Philistia, a Latinization of it. So Pal the Philistines become Palestine. And so then they call this region Palestine, but no, there's never a people called Palestinian. It's just called Palestine, a region of the Roman Empire. Um, but... 
the Philistines are the main en enemy of the Jews. And all through the, the judges, it seems like they're fighting the, Palestine, uh, the Philistines uh, on and on and on and on and on. They, they seem to be the, the one that steps up. You have the, the plain of Philistia down here, and then you have the plain of Phoenicia up here. But this, this is David's kingdom in 1000 B.C., um, you can see it stretches down below Beersheba and all the way up to the Euphrates River. Um, but that's the land of the, that orange section right there. I'll slow it up a little more. Otherwise, my people online can't see. So that, that orange section right there, which is modern-day Gaza, that was the land of the Philistines, which were the enemies of the Jews. Samaritans are not, not in yet. Samaria would be up here, but the Samaritans are not a thing yet. Jesus' time, this probably would have been the Samaritans, you know, because they, they have that going against them. But uh, the rest of mankind, so that Edom may seek the Lord, uh, or that they may possess the remnant of Edom, Edom. Uh, and so you get that difference in Edom and Adam, um, and I, I guess the way to explain that would be more, um, for Jerusalem, the world that existed at the time of Amos, the world existed was the Jews and the Philistines. So the rest of the world is the, the, the country cousins, you know, um, and so that would have been the rest of the world. Although you see all the other all the other nations around that are also related to them. Ammon and Moab are from Lot. Remember the daughters of Lot after they flee uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah most likely somewhere in that Dead Sea. But after they flee from uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah, the daughters go and they sleep with their father Lot when he's drunk and they both have children. One names him Moab, which Moab in Hebrew is from my father. Ammon is of the people. Anyway, so those, when the Israelites are coming to, take, to go into the land, Moab and Ammon are who they have to go through. Edom, Moab, and Ammon. You know, it's kind of like, got to go through the cousins. All right. Um, so that's, that's how you can understand that when you look at it and says, wait a minute, it's Edom, but wait a minute. In, in the New Testament, it says the rest of mankind, how, the, the, it contradicts itself. It's wrong. No, it's not wrong. It's just a different perspective based upon uh, the translation. And by the way, we could accept either Edom or Adam uh, because of the vowel points. Even now, and here's where it becomes pertinent. I'm going to go back to uh, Acts because it, it's the same. Um, all all Gentiles who bear my name, even all Gentiles who bear my name, or who call by my name. So, the the whole point for the for the the church fathers in Jerusalem, the disciples and and the leaders, is whether it's mankind or Edom. It's that Gentiles Goyim, the Goyim, the Gentiles, the nations uh, are already going to be called by the, the name of the Lord. In, in the time of Amos, Already, the word is there that the, uh, the nations will be called. And by the way, it probably wouldn't have been Gentiles back in those days. It would have been the rest of the world or the nations, the Goyim or the rest of the, the nations. So already in the Old Testament, the, the nations are going to be part of God's people. And I'm sure these church leaders also knew the promise to Abraham that by your seed shall all nations be blessed. Uh, 
the promise to David, one will sit on your seat and he will rule all nations. You know, so they understand that there, there's a time coming that it's not going to be very selective. It's not going to be just Jewish, but it's going to be Jewish and all nations. Uh, uh, let's see, it says, Lord, who does these things that have been known for ages. Um, Verse 19. Any, any questions over 16, 17, and 18? Or have I just completely worn that wheel out? All right. Verse 19. This is the, this is the decision of the council. And it's very pertinent. And we're going to talk about verse 20 especially. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for Jews who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue of the Sabbath. Okay, let me read verse 19 again. It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. There's one way. There is only one way to, to God, and that is Jesus. And then they go and they pollute that statement. I'm going to explain how we can understand that in a second. Because Paul, later in his letters, will speak against some of this. About the meat sacrificed idols, because idols are nothing. Um, but verse 20, instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has preached in every city, been preached in every city from the earliest time. So in other words, okay, we're not going to enforce the, the law of Moses as far as circumcision goes, but, uh, wait a minute, hold it. Don't you, don't you eat that, that, that food sacrifice idol. Don't you be eating that strangled, food, strangled meat, you know. So it's kind of like we're not going to add anything to the, what it requires to be a Christian. Ah, but! Okay. In our church, we talk about two concepts or two terms. It's not really concepts. It's doctrines. And they are, they are formative for us. Um, and they're, they're big words. I'm going to write the first one, and you tell me what the second one is. I didn't finish! Okay, my driver in the back seat, a back of the room, just inform me of what the answer is to the second one. Whoops. I can't spell. So justification and sanctification. And in the Lutheran church, we talk about both of those. Justification... Okay, so is justification an instantaneous act, or is it a lifelong growth act? My driver in the back of the room says, what? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's when that Holy Spirit has convicted you that Jesus Christ died for you. That's it. And by the way, that's not of yourself. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. All right? Justification is that instant that Jesus, you, you realize Jesus died for you and you believe. Now, I, I, I'm not into the name it and claim it. I took Jesus as my Savior and all of that. It's that the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin and convinced me that Jesus had died for me. Okay? And it's instantaneous. Justification. You're justified or you're not. If Jeff flips that light switch off in the back of the room, the light's off. If he switches it on, they don't go and go boom, 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 They, on. Uh, remember a movie back in the 80s, uh, Dudley Moore, uh, and Dem uh, Dudley Moore and, uh, who's the other gal? Singer. Um, what? Liza Minnelli. Yeah, Arthur. But Arthur, too, they're, they're out on their own, and they have to go, they're going to look at an apartment, and in the ad it says, I-O-L, 
IOL in every room. IOL in every room. And they go, what? IOL, IOL. So they go to look at the apartment. I mean, I, I, if you know the story, Arthur is a millionaire or heir to a million, and a bunch of millions, but he's been disowned because he married Liza Minnelli and his family didn't ag agree and whatever. Well, actually, their enemy didn't agree to it and, and they tried to bankrupt them. But anyway, so they're looking at this cheapy apartment. And so they, they, they're going through the apartment and, and, and Dudley Moore says, uh, so IOL, oh, yes, yes, yes. And he walks over and he flips the switch. Instant on lighting. And I thought, justification. It's when that word of God all of a sudden takes root in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, and boom, it's there. Now, we could talk about all of the, the work in planting that seed and all of that, the word in cultivating that work and cultivating that seed and watering that seed and so forth and so on, but it's you believe or you don't. There is no middle ground. Jesus says that you're for me or you're against me, period. That's justification. Sanctification. Instantaneous or lifelong? It's a lifelong thing. That's the work that the Holy Spirit does through the church and in our lives and through the Word in convincing us because of what Jesus has done to live a different life. To not live in the way we used to live. To not follow our old ways. But rather to live as Jesus would have us live. That's sanctification. By the way, Sancta, sanctus is holy, so it's the, the process of holying us or living more holy, all right? But it's separate from justification. Sanctification, we will live in our whole life. There will never be a time that we're not working on sanctification until that time that Jesus calls us home because we are always going to be sinners. We're always going to need that. I am, I'm going to try and do better. I'm, I'm going to try and and not live in that way I used to live. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I, I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to help my neighbor more. You know, But see, these are not things that come of us. The old Adam that's within us doesn't want to do these things. The old Adam within us wants to say, it's mine, mine, mine. My time, my money, my house, my car, my life. Don't, don't intrude upon it. It's mine. That's what the world wants us to say. Sanctification teaches us, love one another as I have loved you. It's kind of like it's not mine anymore. It's God's. But see, that's, that's a process. And it's a very hard process to go through because it goes against everything that we are. Everything we are says, it's mine and I need to, I need to have it for myself. And, and that's not where it's at. I remember one time, uh, this is this school year, I always take a ukulele over for, for chapel service. And we, we sing, and I play my ukulele, and I had my ukulele sitting on the table, and one of the kids touched it, and it fell off the table. And the teacher was just irate and saying, don't worry, just don't worry about it. Number one, nothing happened to it. No, and number two, if something did happen, I take it home, and I'll bring one of my other ones. Oh, but they break your ukulele. Kind of, so? And it's not that I have so many of them, but I do have so many of them. But it, it's, I have to say that because my boss is in the back of the room. What? They, yeah, the justification. But I learned a long time ago that what I have is what God has given me to use. And if that, if it gets broken, it gets broken. Oh, well, whatever. Uh, when we went on a mission trip to Alaska. This is. 22 years ago, and I took a baritone ukulele and a soprano ukulele. I had them wrapped in towels. You had to take all your own towels. But I had them wrapped in towels so that they were nice and cushioned and had them set in the suitcase just so. Well, TSA, in their infinite wisdom, decided to search my suitcase, unwrap them, and then just threw them back into the suitcase. When we got there, my soprano was parked in the side of the baritone. Parked in the side of the baritone. I mean, literally, the, the whole side of it was caved in. So, took it out of the suitcase, set it on the, the bench, and one of the gals came to Shelly and said, has, pa has Pastor seen his ukuleles? And Shelly said, yeah, he probably has, but he, you know, he unpacked. 
did he see what happened? Did, 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 he, did he see what happened to his ukulele? And she says, probably. Is he, is he going to be mad? She said, mm, probably not. The only thing that upset me was the sound hole now was on the bottom, not the top or the front, so all the sound went at the carpet and you couldn't hear it. So we got together and we got some duct tape and we put duct tape over that whole side and then you could play it again. And that, by the way, they're still taking that ukulele up there every year. 22 years later. Well, I assume they're taking it. Um, but it, it, be, it became an item for the uh, Alaska mission. But it's kind of like, I didn't, I didn't care. All I cared is that I wanted to use it to teach the kids and I couldn't use it, so we got to figure out what we're going to do to use it. And, it, and we could, once I got back, I could have cut a new side for it, and I could have put, but it's kind of, you know, leave it the way it is. So, you know, I mean, we need to learn that, that what we have is ours, but it's not. It's ours in that God has given it to us to use for the good of our brothers and sisters in Christ and for those out in the world, that they may know his love and they may give glory to him. And that's what sanctification is all about. Now, on to verse 20. You know, we want to write to them and tell them to refrain from uh, or abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals and blood. Why, why put that on them? All right, you're not putting on circumcision. Circumcision is something that nobody would see. Whether you're circumcised or not, nobody's going to know it. But if you are running around eating food circumcised, uh, uh, sacrifice to idols, or uh, joining in parties where the, they've strangled a goat and they're eating the goat meat, uh, or things like that, or you're having blood sausage. Think about it. The items made from blood, blood sausage, you don't be doing that, okay, guys? No blood sausage for you. <laughs> Probably most people in the room are saying, I ain't eating it anyway. Um, but, yes, ma'am. Right. So it, it, what it becomes, and that's good. So it, it, Mindy just brought up, is it similar to saying you should take a, a, a bag along when you go grocery shopping so you don't waste, pla waste plastic bags? You know, we all have these reusable bags, right? You take that along with you, then you put your groceries in there instead of having to have those plastic bags around that are, you know, they, they, you can bury them and they'll be here a thousand years from now. Strongest thing in the world until they get a rip in them, and then one tiny little rip and everything falls out. I mean, you could you take one and try and tear it. You can't, but it gets a little rip in it, and all of a sudden everything's gone. Um, but yeah, it's similar to that. So it's it's a should. It would be it would be good for us to do that, and good for those around us. So now, how do we do that with this? Okay, so Brian has joined our our fellowship. And he is a Gentile. We're not going to make him be uh, circumcised. But if he, all of a sudden he's bringing his ham sandwiches and blood sausage in, and, and we're all sitting here, it, it could be offensive to us. So in deference to us, he, he just told, don't, don't do that. Okay? So it, it's a guideline in how to live in reference to or deference to your brothers because so much of the church is Jewish at that point, and they may very well act in judgment towards Brian if he brings that in. Wrongly so, but in order for peace and, and calmness in the church, we'll, we'll ask that this not be done. So that's, in that way, it's, it's learning to live together. Uh, but like I said, Paul will later on, in fact, Paul in Antioch of Syria takes Peter on because Peter's come up from Jerusalem, and he, he's joining together with the Gentiles, eating ham sandwiches and blood sausage. By the way, that's a, the, you wonder where that line comes from. That comes from Dr. Robert Herber and Lewis Brighton at the seminary. They both used that phrase when they talked about you know this whole Judaizer thing and how Peter had practiced what they were told not to do, eating the ham sandwiches and blood sausage. Uh, and then all of a sudden he understands uh, he understands 
Peter and some of the men from James have come. It's like, ooh, I'll see you guys later. Hi, hi, how's it going? You know, no, 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 I don't know. I, I don't. So he, he's acting in a hypocritical fashion, and, and then Paul will write about, you know, what, whether you eat or not, it doesn't matter. It's whether you consider those around you. And so are you thinking about what, what you're doing and what it's going to do to the faith of those around you? You know, uh, if I, <laughs> we're having a, a youth night tonight for our confirmation class. We're having a movie and tea tonight. And uh, Doug and I were talking, our youth uh, chairman of youth, and he said, all right, so when we get there at 4.30, we'll uh, figure out how many pizzas, or I figure one for you. And I said, well, there was a day. And, you know, my roommate, uh, if Eric was here, he could probably tell you too. You know, I mean, we used to order roundhouse pizza or go to uh, Little Caesars back in the early days up in Michigan. And you'd get the two, la I mean, these were two large pizzas. And you'd get the two large pizzas and you'd take them back to the dorm and you'd eat them. Carl would eat one, I would eat the other one. That, that was the day. I don't do that anymore. And I said to Doug, no, I don't, I don't come anywhere ne ear, near eating a whole pizza. Even when I get one of the little personal pans, I don't come anywhere near it anymore. I just can't. Um, and so, but it's kind of like if I sat down and I ate a whole pizza in front of those kids, what would they say? They might be impressed. They, it would be a bad example for them, and they might very well be thinking, well, why didn't he save some of that for us? Never mind that it was ordered all for me, but it, I'm still, I'm not sharing what I have with them. And so we think about what we do, and it's not just, is it okay for me to do it, but is it okay for me to do it, and how will it be viewed by those around us, around me? You know, will it give a bad example to uh, the, these people? Will it cause them to stumble or fall? Paul talks about, you know, not causing one of the little ones to stumble, you know, and how we of stronger faith have to think about those of weaker faith. You know, because it, it, it does become something that, oh, by the way, why do, why do people not go to church? What's the number, what's the number one, number one excuse for not going to church? The church is filled with hypocrites. And my answer to that is, do you like going to baseball games? Yeah. Do you think everybody there is a diehard fan for that team? Or are some of them just there for the beer? Well, probably some of them are for the beer. So they're hypocrites. Well, no. It's kind of like, yeah. But that's, that's one of the biggest things. Is what, they, what they say on Sunday is not what they say on Monday. And, and so when we look at that, we have to look at the example, the light that we're letting shine. Are we letting Jesus' light shine, or are we shining our own light? And, and I think that's, we're, that's where we're going to stop. But I, I want you to think about your life this week, and not, not, not about what Moses would have you do, but about how you're shining your light, or God's light, to those around you. We'll pick up with verse 22 uh, next week. And uh, we'll go on with the letter that is sent out to the Gentile believers. Um, and we'll, we'll look a little bit more into that. It's pretty well what we've talked about before, but we'll cover that letter. Uh, it, it's verses 24 to 29. Uh, in specific, uh, or 23 to 29. Um, so if you want to read that letter, and uh, Judas and Silas take, take it along with Paul and Barnabas. So, any questions? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that your word is open and available, not just to the Jews, but to all people that there is no extra requirement in order to be a Christian, but it is simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
Now, Heavenly Father, bless each of us as we go out. So let the true light shine through us so that in all things your name may be known and your name may be glorified. To the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.